So today, um, I'm going to talk about contributors, colleagues, customers, and clients. So uh, uh, to uh, keep it upfront, so this is not going to be a marketing talk for an ad, though it's a, it's a sponsored talk. Uh, but we'll look into some of the aspects that we have learned over a period of time working on the open source and um, um, some of the things that um, uh, people who are uh, in the business are doing, right? So uh, we'll look into some of the lessons learned and some of the uh, some takeaways probably, right? So and we'll also look at well, what could be the possibly uh, next for open source. Um, so it, it all started 30 years back, and uh, I think it's appropriate to say 30 years because in um, uh, 1985, the Free Software Foundation was uh, started, and I think it was yesterday, Free so the FSF uh, had the 30-year celebrations. Uh, if you're following, you'll probably know. Um, so 30 years back, Richard Stallman, he wanted to work on a piece of software that would improve the performance of computer that he's using, right? So when he wanted, wanted to get access to that code, um, uh, he, was, he, he couldn't access that. So he tried contacting the people um, who gave the software, but they, they told him that they can give the access, but they, he has to do a lot of paperwork and, uh, um, and stuff. And also importantly, uh, they also said that he wouldn't be allowed to share. Um, so that's something that really got um, uh, Richard Stallman thinking, and um, you know, uh, from from there they started to work on something like a Unix imitation. Um, so the GNU was started, and um, you know, the bunch of people they started to they started to take this path of liberating software. Um, so you know, they. It's uh, because back then, um, uh, if you wanted to use a computer, you had no other means of using it other than having a proprietary software. So uh, many did not like it, but there was no alternative. So, so they, were, they were on their path to liberate software. Right? So, so they continued on the path. And um, you know, um, after, after a certain time, uh, when the word got out, when, they, when people got to know that there's something like new that, was gonna, that is happening in the industry, uh, when they look back, right, so now they had like a lot of people who, who were ready to contribute to the free software. So this was, this was, this was like change, a shift in the way the traditional software used to work and the software being controlled, but Suddenly, there were like people who now had some tools to work on on a free software. So, so it, it was amazing. It was amazing feeling, right? So, um, and after a few years after after the uh, free software foundation, right? Like few, um, there was there were some smart people, extremely uh, smart people, who thought that free software um, is really, really great, and they thought that there is definitely some business opportunity in the free software. So when, they, when these extremely smart people, they took this free software and then went to uh, people saying that, hey, you know what? We have a um, Unix-like system, which is less expensive and runs faster. But the industry really did not accept it that well. Uh, they said, oh. Um, what does free mean here, right? So uh, even though uh, RMS famously said it's free as in freedom and not free as in free beer, but um, in th there were, it was difficult to explain people. So uh, these these business folks, right? So the folks who wanted to make business out of uh, uh, out of free software, they are the ones who coined the term open source. Now, this was different. It was easier to explain. Um, and it's, it also open source also test upon some of the um, um, practicality of developing a software in, in, in a more collaborative and sharing manner. Um, and that was open, and that was uh, freely shareable, right? So, so they, they test upon this. So they coined this term open source. And then the industry started accepting. So, um, so what exactly was open source, right? So open source is a way of collaborating um, with other people, having a free distributed software without having to worry about the 
intellectual property um, and ha without having to go through a lot of legal um, uh, papers or anything of that sort. So this, this, this was a great shift and, um, and people, we started now seeing a lot of contributions coming from a lot of people. So there were contributions from um, uh, individuals, there were contributions from organizations, and there was contributions from um, uh, people who, uh, who were in the academics, right? So um, th there was a huge amount of contributions coming up. Now there were like an army of people who had this GPL and everything with them equipped to take on the world. So what, what exactly was going on in the, in the open source, right? So what was going on inside the open source? It's, it's, it's interesting, right? Um, so there were, there were some rules that were given um, which said that free distribution of software and the source code should be made available with the software, right? And uh, um, uh, the, if anybody wants to improvise this code, you know, he, he should have the ability to um, work on the software freely and uh, distribute it freely, but keeping the original author intact, right? So th there were some golden rules that were laid out. So what, what exactly went on in, um, in open source was completely opposite to what a traditional software uh, development system would look like. You know, in traditional way, you learn that you need to manage complexity. Uh, you need to have a small group of people Right, and then and then you need to you need to um, have a plan and stuff like that. Right, so the open source in the open source it was completely opposite. There were like hundreds of people across globe uh, debating, defending their ideas, and uh, you know being very critical about the peer review code. So it was completely. I mean, if if somebody looks from an outside world, it it, it looked completely chaotic. But then. You know what what was happening was you know there were there were like people who were organically coming together to solve a common problem, right? And when when people do that in a community to come together and organically solve a problem, you know, there is this incredible amount of um, cross pollination of ideas that happen between people. And, and they start producing at a pace that was unprecedented, and it it, it just took off, right? So there were, there were like a lot of people contributing. And industry had never seen the pace at which the innovation was happening. So, um, so it, it was no longer, you know, the person who was sitting next to you was your colleague, but you know, the person who was say working on working somewhere else and remotely was your colleague, and they helped each other um, to to solve this common problem. So, it it was a completely different perspective. So what's what's next for open source, right? So um, um, I think you know it is not something new. This this happened earlier, and I'll I'll uh, tell you uh, you know I'll take you back to the initial Linux days. Um, so I think we are at a stage now where uh, we can look at the cross pollination between the communities rather than the people within the community and with the people, right? So. Um, so let, let me tell you um, about the Linux um, and, and Apache. So when, in, when Linux came, when Linux came, um, it was definitely less expensive, faster, and everything. But the adoption rate was not as much as you would expect it to be um, uh, it, it, in industry, right? So uh, until, until Apache happened. So what Apache did was Apache suddenly gave a business case to, to Linux. So Apache worked best on Linux, and it was faster, and, and ISPs loved it because um, Apache could do something like the, it allowed you to host multiple websites um, on, on a single machine that the then proprietary web servers did not allow them to do, right? So, uh, so this, was, this was completely um, uh, something new. So why, so if you look into it, why, why did, Apache worked best on Linux, right? So it was the community members who were contributing to Linux where, where the community members who were contributing to Apache, right? So, so they were, they were uh, you know, exchanging ideas and there, there, was, this, there was this incredible uh, uh, 
ideas that were exchanged and, and the solutions that the real time solutions were solved right on the fly and in open. So look at look at your colleagues as you know uh, in a much broader perspective. I think that's uh, one of the uh, major shifts that we would want to see uh, uh, in industry is working between communities. So when when you, when you guys think of opening um, or say working on a new project, right? So um, uh, the framework allows you to just start a new new project and and work on it, but I think it's always good to look into what the other projects are there um, um, and try to contribute. Probably, you know, uh, work together rather than working as individuals. So, uh, so that that's one of the message. Um, I think that is important that we we learn as we move forward. Um, so, l let me ask you this: How many uh, of you are entrepreneurs here? Any entrepreneurs? Okay. And anybody who's um, aspiring to be an entrepreneur? Okay, good. So, um, so when when you know it's 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 a platform for entrepreneurs to work on, right? Because open source world is um, uh, is a place where you can freely exchange ideas and and thoughts and everything. It is when when you start a project. Or when you start something, you know it's it's the originality that that counts, right? So people who have started organizations or say uh, uh, startups, you you would think that okay, I have some original idea, and let me start something. But is that enough? Right? Is that enough? Um, that's the question. So, you know, um, interestingly. Um, Voltaire, uh, who is a French Enlightenment writer, uh, he has said that originality is nothing but judicious imitation. Right. So uh, the word judicious is important here. Now, if you if you look at how Linux and GNU came came to this world, um, they were nothing but an imitation of what Unix was doing at that time. Right. But so so it's it's really not what it. It, it's not the not making it the way to work in a new manner, but it is important that you know uh, you have to make it work with a new vision. You know, so uh, so that's that's the key. So so think 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 about originality as something that when you start something, you know, look at it with a new vision that it solves some problem. But that's not entirely enough, right? So. What is important is, um, you know, your idea should be enterprise. And when I say enterprise, you know, um, it it should it should have the capability to take complex things and uh, you know uh, solve complex problems and also earn money for you guys, right? So uh, the earning money is an important thing because you know that kind of leads into what 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 we're going to talk next. Um, uh, because that gives a customer perspective or a client perspective for your product. So, uh, so think think about enterprise. It has a lot of lot of you know the business and everything. But but it, if you look at it, there is a community and there is also environment, right? So so when we when we look at enterprise, you know the choice that you make or set up your project for um, is important. So. When you start a project, don't think of starting a project with just originality in mind, but start a project which can be an enterprise-ready project, right? So, well, when I say enterprise-ready, you have to make right choices. Now, you you guys select Python, right? Because Python is something that we know that there are enterprise uh, products that are already in use or rather using Python, right? So, uh, similarly, uh, Fedora, right? So. Uh, Fedora is future for RHEL, and um, RHEL we have, you know, numerous examples that RHEL has uh, enterprise products running on it, right? So the choice is really important here. So client, right? So um, uh, when you when you set up this, um, you know, uh, the clients, there, there is a very blurry uh, definition of what who is a client and who is a customer. But a client, you can you can um, uh, think of someone with whom 
there is a regular engagement and uh, um, and for a short duration of time right a customer is someone um, with whom you would you would have engagements or say whenever there is an issue comes up or there is a value then you talk to the customer than uh, engaging them on a continuous basis right so uh, so clients are important clients are really important because they really work with you to develop that particular project of yours and make it enterprise ready it, it is important that you know you any startups who want to make a product if you want to say that oh we have customers you know in the initial days it's always clients for you guys because uh, you know you need to engage with them a little bit more and then and then uh, and then you know uh, let them help you to develop a product that is enterprise ready right so uh, um, uh, they, that's that's what red hat does um, you know i don't want to take more time here but uh, that's what red hat does so red hat initiates the project um, which are which are enterprise ready. So when you see a Red Hat initiated project in, in uh, any of the open source world, like Fedora or, or there are numerous of others, they make it enterprise ready projects. But, but it's not a product, right? So um, an enterprise ready project is different from an enterprise product. So the choices that we make at Red Hat uh, for a project is, is really crucial for us. So there's a like lot of brainstorming that happens within the community, um, and I think, I think um, which is really important. Uh, and we make the right choices. And once, once, the, um, once that project is matured enough in community, right, then we, we take it back to uh, the Red Hat, and then you know, we do a lot of hardening of what we call it as hardening of uh, the product, right? and then we release it as an enterprise product. So um, I think that's for any of you guys who want to start a new project. Think, think on those lines. I think that's, uh, that's what I wanted to share today um, uh, from the Red Hat perspective um, as to how you can develop an enterprise um, product. That's all I had. Um, any questions? OK, uh, at the time of building the community, as you said, mm -hmm. so what all challenges were the major ones which you know, were, uh, Red Hat looked as a hurdle towards it? So building community is uh, you know, it's, um, really crucial that you have to be very transparent. You, know, you cannot uh, have discussions which are in closed loop mailing list or um, say with a small set of people. Right, so uh, when when we have decisions that are made um, in public and taking everybody's considerations, you know, they, they, it is bound to happen that there will be a lot of objections, debate, and everything. But if there are logical um, ways of explaining as to what is what is correct, then you know, um, then then it 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 is very fruitful because because you would have ruled out many of the um, uh, problems that might come later at a very early stage. So, um, and another thing is, um, you know, um, uh, it is always good to see collaborating with community that is already doing something rather than starting something own uh, just because, you know, we are Red Hat or something, right? So, um, we always look at, if you see, we work with OpenStack community, right? We, there's, there's a lot of contributions from OpenStack, even though, you know, we can't just go ahead and start another OpenStack kind of community, but we, uh, at Red we don't do that. We really see that. Um, collaborating with other communities is the best way to go forward, and I which is mutually beneficial. I have one question here. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, so I need an advice. Like, if I wish to be a contributor for OpenStack in next two years, mm -hmm. where to start on it? Where should I start, and how should I start? So I think the best way to look at it is, um, you know, there are many ways to contribute to open source, right? You can be an evangelist versus you can be a hardcore developer to uh, somebody who can test and um, report some of the issues, right? So, and you can be an architect, pro but, but many of the things, um, you know, would require you to build credibility over a period of time so that the community accepts. So. Um, to start off, I would say, um, you know, align, know what your aptitude is, right? Um, and, and align any of um, the skills that are in line with your aptitude, 
right? So uh, it is very important that your aptitude is aligned with the skills that you where you would want to contribute. You might have interest to contribute, but if you don't have the aptitude, then it, it might not go take you pretty. Uh, you know, might not take you longer, right? So, um, so I think I think it is important that you get that relation right. And once you get the relation right, you know there are many ways, as I said, from evangelist to whatever, right? Start understanding the understanding the product is good, building credibility that is being on the mailing list. Uh, being on the IRC channels, right, and then um, uh, trying to talk to people and ask questions, right, uh, in 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 the open world, you know, people might criticize you that it's a, it for something it's it's not this list, you know, you just go ahead, but that they are actually correcting your course, right? So don't take it in a negative way. They won't be all that nice all the time, um, but 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 they are always uh, there to take you up to that next level. Right. So, um, did did I answer that? Okay. Uh, also, I would like to add to that question. Uh, day before yesterday, we had a dev sprint. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, if there is any, also you can talk to the people at the Red Hat booth. They can help you. Uh, one of the things uh, when he asked about communities, uh, the thing about communities is uh, I've been with Red Hat for more than ten years and. When I started off with Red Hat, uh, we were just an enterprise Linux company. Now we can't call ourselves an enterprise Linux company anymore because we are in the cloud, we are into storage, and we are into many things. So one of the lucky things which Red Hat had was, it was uh, earlier on it was one of the only free and open source companies which was making money. Uh, and most of our products are free. Uh, in fact, 99% uh, of our products are free. The only products which are not free are the companies which we just acquire and we s try to see how we can open source those things for the mutual benefit of us. Uh, and the second thing why Red Hat has been successful even from a business perspective is one of the core uh, DNAs of the companies, we have an upstream first policy. Upstream first policy is basically whatever code we contribute, we send it upstream first to upstream products like the Linux product or the tech community and all. So uh, like most of us are software engineers for the first major thing about any software, proprietary or open source, software is always a liability. Okay, Even if it's a proprietary software or open source software, both software ship without warranty. As in it fails in your customer premises, it fails in productions, none of these companies will provide a warranty of your software being run. So one of the things which we do in that way is uh, we try to not maintain many, for, for example, many of you, uh, I mean, in your Git, uh, in your Python projects, you have this requirements.txt file, okay, which you pull, which you pull into your projects, okay. Although your application requires only a few of it, you're not maintaining all those 30 dependencies, 40 dependencies in your project. Who maintains those dependencies? If any of those dependencies fail, your project also fails. When I mean a liability, these are the liabilities. So, uh, I mean, a general perspective is there are about three million open source projects right now of which only 20,000 make it to upstream distributions like a Debian or a Fedora, of which only like 5,000 make it to a enterprise distribution like Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So why do you think there are three million softwares and I mean, can't we ship all of this? Only the most stable ones do get shipped as an enterprise product because as Red Hat, we, sh uh, we support these things for seven years. So if you take a look at what's a successful software project or what's an unsuccessful software project, these are a few things which you need to keep in mind. And irrespective if it's proprietary or open source, few things are pretty common for a successful software. And one of the things is the stability of your code. You don't go on changing the, you don't go on changing the interfaces in your code because there are many other people without your knowledge are using your software, providing stable interfaces, providing stable binary. Like most of you know about what a application programming interface is, uh, API. How many of you know what a ABI is? Application binary interface. So application binary interfaces, for example, if you're writing a product, okay, you won't go ahead and define what a printf and a scanf is. You you accept that the operating system does a printf and a scanf for you. Okay? You trust the operating system for it. Imagine uh, the developer, say the glibc developer decides to change printf from foo is equal to a plus b is equal to foo is equal to b plus a. Okay, as a definition of printf. Although your although your programs will behave the same. There's a breakage in your code which is being consumed by your applications. So these are the 
kind of things which you need to keep in mind when you're building stable softwares around communities, stable uh, stable communities also. For example, a uh, small example is NumPy. How many of you have used NumPy? Okay. Not many of you know that there have been, NumPy is one of the popular Python scientific application software. But not, of, not many people know the ABI of NumPy hasn't changed in 10 years. What is the outcome of this? Now there are three big companies which have built around, who have built softwares around NumPy, like Nthought. Nthought has built software. Continuum.io has built software. And there are many popular projects like Pandas and all who have just used the NumPy array to build a lot of softwares. And there are communities around it. And there are conferences like PyData, the SciPy conferences around this. Why do you think? This is just one small library with a very stable interface. So if your projects have that stable interface in that, then you can build stronger communities, stronger people come and contribute to these projects, and even companies will start using this. So this is one of the things about contributions and how to make stronger communities from the software perspective. Um, we are a Python development firm based out of Cochin, Kerala. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to know if uh, there are avenues for us to partner with uh, Red Hat's products to take to our customers uh, if there's any way in which we can add value. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, um, Red Hat, um, um, if you go to redhat.com slash partners, you know, um, uh, there are ways of associating, uh, attaching your company with, uh, with Red Hat. And um, wh what, what you can do is, you know, um, if, you, if you know people who, um, uh, if you know customers who, whose strength um, and weaknesses, then probably you know you will be able to pitch your product with Red Hat products. And uh, whenever Red Hat, when Red Hat understands your uh, business, right? So uh, whenever there is a solution, uh, you know we have solution architects which, who go and create solutions to the customers. Um, so if if they see that your product is in line with somewhere who is already a partner of Red Hat then there are definitely avenues that you can work with them and um, you know uh, take take it forward uh, has the capacity to build rpms using the bdist and the sdist output so one of the things say if you want red hat customers to use your product it's a simple way when you build your software uh, using the python setup.py tools with along with dist tutorials and other things you can build out rpms so once you build out rpms you're not only testing it uh, with the Python ecosystem, you're also testing it with, say, RPM dis distribution. The same thing with Debian-based distributions. What happens is, instead of uh, you trying to solve problems on every distro, the Python's build ecosystem builds it for every <coughs> distro. So that way you get access to the whole community of users uh, which, which test this. And if it's better, it's open source. For example, each bug Red Hat solves in Fedora or Upstream, like say Fedora or upstream openstack.org or on Fedora, Red Hat saves a lot of money. As you're engaging the upstream open source community to leverage, to find bugs, and to fix bugs upstream itself before you support those softwares. So that's one way you can start en engaging. And uh, if it's an enterprise product, yeah, most of the enterprise, the enterprise industry doesn't move as fast as your typical software stacks, because in a startup, the software stacks change very fast because they're re-architecturing every eight months, 10 months. But in an enterprise stack, it moves very slow because the kind of customers who use these softwares are banks, governments, uh, stock exchanges, where they don't want change. They, their thing is more of stability than innovation. Yeah, there is a lot of innovation which happens, but it's not their higher priority. It's like, okay, let's try a rewrite our application in Scala. No, it doesn't. Because they're happy with C, and they get performance and results with C. Yeah, that's why it's important that you know the right kind of choices that you make, the platforms that you work on, um, in in the initial time, where your software is going to sit on top of that particular platform, and and the language of choice and everything, right? So that 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 is really important because you set yourself for a more stable and a more enterprise kind of a project, uh, which has the potential to become an enterprise product, right? So. Uh, so whatever the changes that you uh, see, there, there's a lot of innovation that happens at the very initial stages of the company. But as you move forward, you know, it definitely will have um, a slack in terms of innovation, but you'd rather want to make it more stable and everything, right? So um, that's where you shouldn't be struggling with, oh, okay, we chose something when we started. Now we have to see, uh, do something else, right? So that, that's why that thought process 
um, of thinking from an enterprise perspective is really important. It's not just the ideas. And, and also, if you're starting a new project or something, one of the one of the mistakes which I did earlier on being an open source contributor is I never thought about deployments. Uh, to be frank, okay, thinking thinking about deployments from day one of your project. Who, like for example, right now Python, okay, and just look at the way people are deploying Python software right now. They deploy it in a traditional way on bare metal. They deploy it on VMs. They deploy it on containerized applications. It's very heterogeneous, as in one company. Uh, I mean, those days are gone where one company says, use our own programming languages, use our own compilers, uh, deploy it on our own servers. Right now, the customers can have everything. They can have a Microsoft kind of a thing. They can have VMware. And also, they'll have Linux. Okay, it's, uh, uh, The customers have a choice of choosing how they want to deploy your software. So if you write, a, if you write your application and open at that, you can deploy it via containers. You can deploy it via, uh, as a VM images, everything. You need to the more the more ways you can get customers to install your software is one of the faster ways you can get adoption of your uh, practices and the second thing is yeah I mean when he asked about how many entrepreneurs are there and how many want to be entrepreneurs see each of us are always learners and we are always entrepreneurs in some other way okay? either you are trying to hype up yourself within your company showing your technologies or something so these are the changes which you need to be aware of what's going on in the industry what are the better practices this one happens when you meet, come to meetups, uh, read the Python planets, and also read the popular open stock aggregators. So uh, you get to know how it's evolving. Like for example, the containers. Everybody knows, everybody wants to be in the container space, but nobody, there's no clear idea. Okay, I can make a container image, but how am I going to have it in my data center? Are there clustering things available? Does one company provide it? Does, it mean, does many companies provide it? So those are the kind of decisions which you need to take earlier on in your project. As in thinking about deployment from day one of your project gives you a better leverage over other softwares which who don't think about their deployments. So they'll just have a exe file or a DMG file or something like that and say, okay, we can deploy it anywhere. So like those things. Okay, thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks for this.